I'd like to begin this discussion by telling you the story of a lady who called me about uh, roughly two weeks ago to tell me the story of her three-year-old adopted son. She had three children of her own and adopted this two-year-old who had had quite a history. He was fetal alcohol syndrome. Both of his parents were alcoholic. Poor lad was in a lot of trouble. And when he arrived at their home, he proved to be all but incorrigible. He was totally unmanageable. As a matter of fact, he was so difficult to handle, the lady actually <laughs> put him into a daycare center just so she could not have to spend an entire 24 hours every day with this poor lad. In any event, she sooner or later heard about Becalmed, gave us a call, and asked if it would be all right to give Becalmed to a three-year-old. Now, our answer was that the official studies indicate it is safe for a six-year-old. Nobody has studied anyone younger than that. We've had a number of people report him giving become to as young as four-year-olds, numerous five-year-olds, but no one had yet reported three. So I passed this on to her, told her that if he was eating normal food, I knew of no technical reason why it would be harmful. But on the other hand, I could not advise it as we had no scientific proof that it was all right for a three-year-old. In any event, she ordered a bottle. And the day that the bottle arrived, the boy got off the school bus and she gave him not the half capsule we had suggested, but she gave him a full capsule. And <laughs> the uh, lad took the capsule, joined her and his older brother then for a ride down to the husband and father's workplace, which happened to be a lumberyard, so that his lunch could be delivered to him. On the way there, she reported that the three-year-old was just totally unmanageable as usual. He was pulling the five-year-old's hair, he was screaming, he was shouting. As a matter of fact, she said she nearly wrecked the car twice just getting to the lumber yard. Well, they stopped, had a brief conversation with her husband there at his workplace. And by the time they were on their way back, over about an half, half an hour had passed. And she said on the way back, it was just incredible. The three-year-old was laughing and giggling with a five-year-old. They were having a good time. She had no problems at all driving. They got home safe and sound. But she said that wasn't the big miracle. The big miracle occurred when a neighbor came by about 10 days later and said, we've got to know exactly what has happened. She said this three-year-old had been so badly uh, misbehaving that they had refused to allow them in their homes, any of the neighbors had. They considered him incorrigible and a bad influence on their children. And now all of a sudden, within this 10-day period, he had become the best-behaved kid in the whole block. And she just had to know what in the world had gone on to work this miracle. Well, we hear this sort of thing a great deal. Telephone calls come in nearly daily from people who have had stories such as this one or have observed situations such as this one. And we're frequently asked just how in the world all this came about, where did it start from, what was the beginning, and so we are going to pass that information out on that tape. This tape, rather, will be dedicated to understanding the product, how it works, what it can be used for, and we do this in the hopes that perhaps you can work a miracle in your own life or that of someone you know. In any event, it all began back in roughly 1928. At that time, the medical profession received some clues to a problem that was about as old as medicine itself. Why does psychological stress cause physical damage to the body, was the question. Well, it seems that a college professor named Hans Selye at the University of Montreal had resolved that the damage was being done by an excessive release of adrenaline. His first thought was to remove the adrenal glands from cattle, who were on the way to becoming steaks anyway, uh, in any event, he removed these adrenal glands, and the cows died within a very short period of time. Now, obviously, removing adrenal glands is not the way to fix the problem of a human being, so he sort of took a short tack at this point and said, all right, let's look at the first question, which is, which diseases are caused by the release of the excessive adrenaline? And, of course, the second question, is this the only stress cause 
damage chain? Well, these questions sparked a lot of research. Some of it was very scientific. You know, you, you analyze a problem and then you synthesize a solution from the factors presented. Some of the research, however, came from accidental discoveries. For instance, there were a team of heart specialists and they decided that the time had come to reupholster their waiting room. Well, <laughs> the first thing that happened was the upholster came in and asked, why are only the front edge of the chairs in your waiting room worn out? And the answer to that question led them to defining A and B personalities. It seems the A's were found to release large amounts of adrenaline as shown by the fact that they were highly excitable and thus sat on the edge of the chair. And this adrenaline caused high blood pressure, which in turn caused heart attacks and strokes. Well, the research became more and more intense at this point. And in the five years from 1985 to 1990, there were 20,000 scientific papers reporting new stress-related diseases. And still, the solution to the problem, however, was as elusive as it had ever been. Ever since the time of Cellier, <laughs> how do you fix it? We got a handle now on what the cause is, how do we fix it? Well, a lot of work went by the bridge, and then we happened to put together a team back in 1984. It consisted of Dr. Kenneth Blum, who held a double chair in the pharmacology department at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, Dr. Michael Trachtenberg, who had held a full professorship in the medical school at Harvard, and myself. And we set about to make use of Dr. Blum's discovery that the craving for alcohol can be taken away through the use of the amino acid D-phenylalanine. Further research showed that the craving reduction could be increased by adding the amino acids L-glutamine and L-tryptophan. Probably at this point there may be a possibility that your high school or college chemistry is far enough behind you that you might like a few definitions just sort of uh, to make the rest of this a little easier to follow. First of all, amino acids are the building blocks used by man's and animal's bodies to make proteins. That is, when we eat meat and certain plants, our bodies break down the food into amino acids, many other things, of course, but among others, they make amino acids. Our many and various manufacturing cells, in turn, use them as manufacturing facilities would use raw materials. That is, they make the protein which ultimately becomes tissue and fluids within us. Eight of the 21 amino acids that we use are essential to our staying alive. One of these eight is L-tryptophan. The current FDA ban on tryptophan is, we believe, political rather than substantive, but in any event, we have found a substitute for it. Now, perhaps the place to start is to explain the use of the brain chemicals which are made from the amino acids and the minerals that are in the product that our company finally developed. To do this, let's imagine the thoughts that might be going on in the mind of Mr. Herbert Schneider, a forest ranger in Yellowstone National Park. He's decided this particular evening, let's say, to take a hike through one of his favorite mountain trails. Well, just as he gets to the midway point, he hears what sounds like a growl of a cougar a mountain lion to you if you uh, have not been raised in the mountains, from somewhere down deep in the underbrush of the forest. And he remembers his supervisor warning that there is an aged cougar that is believed to have wandered up from Yellowstone, or rather to Yellowstone, from the Grand Tetons itself. Well, he knows that if that growl is what he thinks it is, he has got himself a big problem. He breaks into a trot, and then a run as he hears the big cat break through the thicket and head toward him. Well, at this point, the 50-year-old Herbert's only hope is to run the 100 yards to a small cave entrance that lies less than, or rather, uh, run this distance, this uh, 100 yards, in less than nine seconds. Now, the cave has brush at the entrance, which Herbert believes will confuse the cat just long enough to allow a large stone to be placed at the entrance from inside the cave. The body's reaction is often called the fight-or-flee response when this sort of a situation arises. In it, five different emotional sensations are triggered by as many brain chemicals referred to as neurotransmitters. The first of these is a neurotransmitter group called the opioids. The greatest number of them are in the encephalin molecule, a part of which is the one 
referred to as endorphin, you know, the one in the runner's high theme and so forth. But if the opioids are, for, are forced to fall into short supply, one experiences a sense of urgency. Well, now this, of course, is a good thing to have when one is under attack. Incidentally, if the opioids are forced into oversupply, one experiences euphoria and the reduction in any mild pain, such as that of exercise. Thus, the runner's high effectively encourages you to run again tomorrow by giving you euphoria and taking away the pain of the running. On the other hand, if the body wants you to do something, it shorts your opioids and you feel this strong sense of urgency. The second sensation is caused by the neurotransmitter called gamma amino butyric acid, or GABA for short. And when the opioids are reduced by stress, they force GABA levels down also. And the result is a feeling of anxiety. Uh, if you, I feel you will probably agree that anxiety is a good thing to have when you're under attack. Well, the combined feeling of urgency and anxiety could cause feelings of defeatism. However, when the opioids go down, a third neurotransmitter is called into play. This brain chemical is called dopamine. When it's released, it causes feelings of being undefeatable. However, when it is overused to a point of short supply, one experiences a reduction in attention span and has feelings of a lack of caring about anything. No ability to appreciate music, the beauty of, for instance, a sunset, and ultimately a lack of ability to love pets, family, friends, or even romantic love. Well, the fourth neurotransmitter, norepinephrine, is perhaps the most important one of all. It is released when GABA levels go down. Norepinephrine release causes a rush feeling that many people find pleasurable. It's generally associated with adrenaline release because it causes the adrenaline glands to release adrenaline into the bloodstream. Adrenaline, in turn, causes oxygen and energy to be taken from the internal organs and delivered to the muscles. To speed this delivery, it causes the heart to beat both harder and faster. Now, this provides our 50-year-old friend Herbert with the ability to run the 190 seconds, a feat he could not otherwise possibly do. Thus, the adrenaline gives him the ability to save his life, or in another well-known example, it allows a mother to pick a car up off of a trapped child. The norepinephrine release causes the fifth neurotransmitter, serotonin, causes its levels to go down. Serotonin, you will recall, is the neurotransmitter which enables sleep and feelings of well-being. Thus, if the attack were a prolonged one, such as in wartime, the young soldier who would otherwise sleep at the drop of a hat is here, nonetheless, able to stand watch and not fall asleep because of the stress of the situation at hand. The reduction in serotonin causes a further decline in the opioid, and this is essential in the case of an attack that lasts for several hours. However, in the case of 20th century stress, this can actually cause death, and here's how. Let's take this example. Mr. Jones and, let's say, Mrs. Smith both arise to find their spouses need something that they can't afford to buy. A little stress gets going there. Then each gets onto the freeway and rush hour traffic. We all know what that's like. At the jobs, the pressure's on, as it always is, and their livelihood seems to be continually threatened, and it goes that way all day long. The result is that they are always in a stressful situation, which causes their blood pressure to remain high and their internal organs to be continually deprived of oxygen and energy. Now, this situation has been shown to cause over 20,000 different diseases high blood pressure, strokes, heart attacks, to say nothing of liver, kidney, stomach, intestinal, colon, and so forth, disorders and diseases. Well, a solution to this whole problem can be understood by considering the following. Let's say that you're about to speak before a large audience. You step to the microphone, you snap your fingers, and the sound is picked up by the microphone. It's amplified by the sound system, which causes the loudspeaker in the back of the hall to make a big, strong sort of sound, which is heavy enough to travel all the way back to the microphone. The result is a large ringing sound, and the very system that was put there to make communications possible is now making the entire hall unusable. The problem is fixed by simply turning the volume control down to a point at which the sounds from the loudspeaker are not picked up by the microphone. 
Well, similarly, the brain uses the neurotransmitters and the related enzymes and hormones to do the equivalent of turning down the volume control. Thus, they set the point which stress causes the fight or flee response to begin. However, if they are used too long and or too often, the body runs out of them and they can no longer keep the adrenaline release limited to times of actual physical attack. The result, health deterioration to a point that a person can die. And the solution is to give that person the raw materials his body needs to allow it, the body, to make as much of the brain chemicals as it requires. It's as simple as that. And the raw materials are all found in the nutritional supplement Becalmed. Dr. Kenneth Blum, whom I mentioned earlier, discovered in the 1980s that roughly 80% of American alcoholics are genetically linked to it. Further research led to the knowledge that such people have a shortage of the ability to produce sufficient opioids, serotonin, and or GABA. As a shortage of the opioids ultimately causes a shortage of dopamine and norepinephrine, the raw materials for all five are thus required. Well, between 1985 and 1989, over 60,000 alcoholics received a lessening or even complete elimination of the compulsion to drink alcohol through the use of these supplements. The formula mixture used at that time was slightly different than the current become, but it has been adjusted to be more useful in taking care of the stress situation, which turns out is quite related. For when we deal with the alcoholic whose primary shortage is the opioids, we note that the opioids cause continual draining of the other items. And as we have seen under stress, they are all diminished. And so therefore, we balanced it a bit more, called it becalmed, and came up with the current product in about 1991. By 91, that formula had been proved and is now also used to prevent, of course, psychological stress from causing physical damage to the body, as I just explained. And also, it has now been found to be very useful in eliminating many of the problems found with attention deficit disorder. This all came about in 1992 when a researcher in the state of Washington, Dr. Terry Nair, observed that his patients suffering from attention deficits and or hyperactivity disorders had shortages of the same neurotransmitters as did the people suffering from extreme stress. He therefore tried Becalmed on 16 patients that he currently had on Ritalin. Well, over 60% of them, 62.5 if you like numbers, had 60% um, uh, of them uh, did far better on Becalmed and he had to put the others back on Ritalin. The logic was as follows. The child or adult whose hyperactivity is caused by a shortage of opioids, and usually this is a shortage of serotonin and GABA going with it, has a strong sense of urgency all of the time. Sooner or later, this person learns that exercise helps. Remember, exercise releases more of the opioids. This is because as this occurs and the opioids are released, person feels more calm, tends toward euphoria from their excitable state that they were already in, and so therefore they have found a way to self-medicate that portion of the problem. Of course, such release further depletes the opioid reserves, and in the end the person must spend a great deal of time in exercise to be able to self-medicate away the bad feelings caused by this neurotransmitter shortage. Often such a person learns that norepinephrine, adrenaline if you will, that that rush will mask these feelings and that he can achieve the same type of self-medication by doing anything dangerous. The child, for instance, will risk getting spanked or otherwise disciplined toward this end. The adult might take up skydiving, bungee jumping, car racing, or some other dangerous hobby just to get this effect. Well, let's talk about attention deficit disorder. We've, we've covered hyperactivity fairly well, but attention deficit is quite a different thing. This is caused by a shortage of dopamine in many, in many instances. For um, the uh, shortage of dopamine, with or without the usual accompanying shortage of serotonin, causes this short attention span. Most of us have an attention span of at least 50 minutes. That's why classes in the schools are normally set for that period. Now, 
If one has an extreme shortage of dopamine, it's been observed that it could be as low as 10 seconds attention span. As an example, suppose an individual's attention span, which would be typical for a child with this problem, suppose that his attention span is as low as 5 to 10 minutes. By the end of that much time in class or at home or wherever, he can no longer concentrate on the proceedings of the, the moment, such as the classroom activity. He may then daydream, fall asleep, or if he's hyperactive, this will be the point at which he'll get up and run around the classroom. As a result, he or she will move from one activity to another, and they will rarely be able to finish anything. And in often cases, uh, or rather often times, the individual will be looking for some kind of punishment because this will give the adrenaline rush, which is so helpful. This person will also have a very low anger threshold. This develops as a habit to increase the adrenaline rush time. He'll have trouble sleeping, and he may exhibit hypertension. High blood pressure can be as high as 170 over 120 or 30 in some of these situations. Well, we've talked about a great many things, and we have also forgotten to mention perhaps a very important one to those of you who are listening to this tapes in the hope of learning something that will help you sell the product. We'd like to mention that the American Medical Association claims that about 7% of the American population is alcoholic, that 75 to 85 percent of the cases seen by internists and family physicians are caused by stress, and close to 30 percent of the children in our schools suffer from attention deficit disorder. This problem affects nearly all of us, directly or indirectly. And right now, there is an incredible focus in this nation on attention deficit disorder. We have a partial solution, or at least a solution for about 60% of those who suffer from this disease. It's something that you can talk to parents, tell them about the things you've heard on this tape, and the probability of making a sale gets to be really very high. Well, we've covered an awful lot of ground in this brief 12 minutes. We certainly hope that it's been useful to you. Hope that you will join us in giving this product to all of these people who desperately need it to help them in their current situation. Thank you and good luck.